indeed we do have an anchor and how blessed we are that Jesus Christ has provided that for us, that uh, we have that wonderful hope. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate those who are present and those who are joining us other, in other ways. If you want to be turning in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5, that'll be our beginning reading. But I want to begin with a statement that I've heard said in this form and similar forms, something along the lines of attitude is everything. You know, if you just have that right attitude, you can do anything. Let me say to you, that's a, that's a gross overstatement. You know, back a long time ago, I played basketball. And I, I think I had a pretty good attitude. I was coachable. I worked at it. I wasn't going to make the NBA, and it wasn't because of my attitude. It was this thing called lack of talent. You know, that, you know attitude isn't everything. And yet, one's attitude, his mindset, the way he views things, his perspective, does make a tremendous difference. Think about what Jesus called the first two commandments, the two greatest. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, he said, was like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Though both of those would require actions, they really are a mindset. It is an attitude that says, I'm going to love God. I'm going to love others. And in my reading the other day in 2 Corinthians 5, I was reading and it just hit me. I mean, that's something I've known, but it hit me hard. Verses 14 and 15, Paul talks about living for Christ. If he died for us, we ought to live for him. Verse 15. And then in verse 16, he says, Therefore, you know, because of that, because of the fact that he lived and died for us, he rose again and gave us hope, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The statements that are made in verse 17 about all things have become new. One is a new creation. Sometimes people apply that to, they say, you know, we are a new creation in that all our sins are forgiven. We are elsewhere called the new man in Christ. And that's so true. But look at the context of what Paul is saying. He is saying there was a time when we saw Christ in a fleshly way. We don't see him that way anymore. We no longer know Him according to the flesh. We regard no one. He's talking, I believe, about a different outlook. In Christ now, I'm a different person. And therefore, all things are new to me. Not that I've been forgiven. It's because I've been forgiven. It's because I'm in Christ, I suddenly see things differently. I have a different outlook. And I want to talk about a few things tonight that we ought to see differently. Some of them are very obvious. You know, morality. I mean, think about a person who is not a Christian, who doesn't know God. How do they view the human body? their own body, the bodies of others, especially as it relates to sexual things. Well, the body is here for pleasure. People are there for my own pleasures. That's what it's all about. 
And yet, you come to Christ, you see things differently. You realize that while the human body is capable of these pleasures, they are regulated. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. You know, there is a proper place, but God places regulation. I have a, you know, the world is out for you get what you can. Enjoy as much pleasure as possible. No consequences. You come to Christ, you see it differently. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And he's going to name ten things. Four of the ten are directly related to sexual morality. And one, a fifth one, idolatry, in the first century was closely associated with it. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. A person comes to Christ, their perspective is not, their mindset, the way they see things is not, well, what's, what's in it for me? It's what does God say? I mean, there's been a tremendous effort in recent years, even among religious people, to sort of bend and see the Bible through the culture's morality, the prevalent morality. You know, first it was in the heterosexual realm that, well, you know, God wants us to be loving people and, you know, we ought not to put restrictions on people and so we kind of, Adultery, especially committed in divorce and remarriage, became accepted. As long as people were in a committed relationship, they didn't have to be married, but, you know, we wanted a committed. And then after a while, the committed got dropped. Now, you see people trying to justify, even religious people, the homosexuality. If we truly are in Christ... The order gets reversed. We view morality through the biblical lens. We don't try to say, okay, this is the way it is. Let's see if we can make the Bible fit it. No. We see morality completely differently. We see our language. Do I have to tell you that profanity is all around us? And it's nothing new. I remember... I was taking a literature course at uh, UAB years ago and we were reading Chaucer's Tales. You know, Chaucer lived, what, I forget. It's been, it's been a long time ago. You know, 1100s, 1200s, you know, somewhere back there. It was before most of y'all were born. Um, um, but there, was, there were curse words in the Canterbury Tales. I'm like, really? You know, They had bad language then. I heard some bad language growing up. But I also know this. There's way more of it on television now than there used to be. You know, language that used to be only on the premium cable channels like the HBOs is now on network television. You know, people, they have no compunction at all about, you can be standing in, you know, Pre-COVID, I'd be standing in line at Walmart. Uh, you know, and there are people talking, and they're just using all manner of profanities, not caring who's around. Because that's just normal, right? Unless you're in Christ. You see it a lot differently. You see that your language does matter. Matthew 12 is just one passage, and there are many. The things I'm bringing out tonight... They can all be lessons of themselves. Matthew 12, verse 34. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now in this context, he was especially concerned about blasphemy. And there is no respect for the name of God in our culture. But a Christian sees it differently. You know, the Christian doesn't take God's name lightly. The Christian doesn't let, you know, look at Ephesians 4. There are so many things we could talk about with the tongue. But Ephesians 4, 29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. He gives us the opposite. What is good for necessary edification? In verse 4 of the 5th chapter, There's not to be filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting. He said, which are not fitting. The world says, look, I can say what I want to say. You know, the, the, the mindset is, after all, we've got freedom of speech. I'm an adult. Nobody's going to tell me what to say. A Christian looks at it differently. He looks at it and he says, what does God want me to say? What does God not want me to say? We see things differently. Dress is a, a way, our clothing. Look at 1 Timothy 2 and verse 10. Well, we'll pick up at verse 8 and go through verse 10 and set what I think is an important context. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. I want to back up to about the middle of that text, which is proper for women professing godliness. The idea of that which is proper naturally suggests there is that which is improper. The world, how, does, how do people around us see clothing? Decide what they're going to wear. Well, sometimes it's purely for comfort. They just want to be comfortable. But so often it's about fashion. It's about style. It's about being, backing up to the first point, it's about being sexually attractive to others. The Christian is concerned about godliness. And look at this context. You know, sometimes people have said, well, this doesn't say anything about not wearing enough clothes. It just talks about wearing too many. This is a context that talks about men pray everywhere. You know, and I think the idea is of leading in prayer. Women learning in silence. He's saying to the women, don't dress in such a way that is drawing attention to you when your position should be that of quietness. But it ought to be obvious there are other ways one can dress in a way that's not proper for godliness. The Bible talks about lewdness. The Bible talks about not being a stumbling block to others. And sometimes our clothing, when there's not enough of it, or it's too low, or it's too tight, or too short, it can be all of that. The point of my lesson tonight is not to try to give you all the different ways you can dress improperly or what. It's to get us to understand that in Christ, we just have a different perspective. We look at it differently. The first thing we look at is not, is this going to make me look good? The first thing we ask is, is this proper for a Christian? 
Will this in any way dim my light shining in this world? There are in situations and circumstances in which one can be fashionable and still do that. But style and fashion won't be my first consideration. If I've got that all things made new. If I'm remembering that in Christ, I just see everything differently. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. I've got a different attitude. I, I look at money differently. Look at 1 Timothy 6. A familiar text, I know. But I may have said this before. But I, I remember reading, and I don't remember where I read it. But a, a man said one time, he said, I wish I could read the Gospel of John again for the first time. You know, it's just about what a, an amazing book it was. And he said, I wish I could know what it was like to feel that amazement for the first time again. And that, that's a, there are a lot of things like that. Of course, the more you read it, of course, the more details you get. But sometimes with texts like 1 Timothy 6, we've heard it so many times, we can become callous to it. And we can't. Verse 6 says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. What's the general mindset of people really around the world when it comes to money? More is better. The more you have, we measure net worth in terms of dollars. We, I mean, you've seen the insane lines that form when the Powerball gets to a certain number. You know, they'll have the Powerball's worth 50 million. People don't bother. It gets to 500 million. And, you know, the lines are, you know, people can't even get off the interstates because they're backed up so far. You know, money, lots of it. That's, a, that's what drives us. If that's the prime motivator in my life, if, if the acquisition of wealth is my main goal, then all things have not become new to me. That's part of the old way. But now, that doesn't mean money itself is bad because money gives us opportunity. Look at verse 17. To those who have, he said, let them be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Sometimes we take verse 16, or verse 18 rather, and he talks about ready to give, willing to share, and we think somehow that negates what he said in verse 9 about those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. Well, you know, it's okay because, you know, I, I, I really want to be rich. You know, I'm trying to get rich. I'm doing everything I can to get rich. But I plan to do a lot of good with it. Look at 2 Corinthians 8. What he said to the, about the churches of Macedonia, he said this to the Corinthians who were in Achaia, but he said, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, 
that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Here are people in deep poverty, and what did they do? They gave, he said, beyond their ability. We often say, just do the best you can. Well, he said they did better than the best they could. And they didn't have anything. If a person is generous, they won't wait till they get rich. And then they'll start, you know, once I get there, I'll start doing a lot of good. No. No, they won't. They're doing it for themselves. Those who truly are, have the right attitude, even in their poverty, they look out for others. They want to help others. Back in 1 Timothy 6, there is a warning sounded. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And I think we all need to see what he says here about not being haughty and the realization God gives us. And yes, to enjoy. It's not wrong to enjoy things in this life. The blessings we've been given. But we need to be very careful. Very careful. We don't become like Nebuchadnezzar. Remember what he said in Daniel 4? Is this not great Babylon that I have built? That we begin to think about whatever we have, whether some would think it's a little, others would view it as a lot, whatever it is. It was God who gave to us. I'm not minimizing the work that people put in. We're going to talk about work in just a second. But we must not be haughty, not arrogant. The world boasts of their accomplishments and how much they have made and what they have built. The Christian sees it as God's blessing upon him. And that, that brings me to work. These two are closely related. But it seems like work defines a lot of people. You know, it, it's who they are. Work is expected of us. Look at 2 Thessalonians 3. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Verse 12, Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. How do I see work as a Christian? Well, I don't see it as something to be avoided. I see it as something that is a responsibility. If it, if it is within my capability, I'm expected to eat my own bread, not somebody else's. That I'm expected to provide for myself. 1 Timothy 5, 8, and for those of his own household. If a man won't do that, he's worse than an unbeliever. I don't see work. You know, there are a lot of people. They see work as something that you're doing your best to get out of it. Work is something we're expected to do because we have responsibilities. But when you're in Christ... When you have that vision that's been changed, been altered, you understand work is important, but you realize work's not the most important thing. Matthew 6, you know that the kingdom of God is most important. 
in a context of not worrying about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. You put it first. And even, you know, we, we will be hard on someone. Well, Paul was hard on the man that would not provide for his own. 1 Timothy 5, 8 said, worse than an unbeliever. But what was said in Ephesians 4 and verse 28? Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may be able to give to him who's in need. You know, that's one of those, if you're reading it for the first time, and, it, and the sentence in, you know, the page broke at just the right spot, you would expect to flip the page over that he may be able to provide for his family. That's what you'd expect. He says, no, instead of being a taker, you become a giver. Do I, you know, when you get up in the morning and you go to work, do you go to work thinking, you know, this will enable me to help somebody else? Or is it all about, this is going to help me to buy that new boat, that new toy, whatever, you know. How do I see it? When we are in Christ, we see things differently. We see people. You know, you come to Christ, you become a Christian, you still got eyes and ears. You realize people look different. They talk different. I mean, the variety of ways in which we're different. I mean, there are obvious ones. You know, skin color, height, weight, you know, some of us are good looking and some of y'all, I mean, it's just, um, you know, some people have good hair and some of us don't, you know, I mean, it's, some people speak with perfect polished grammar and some of us, you know, not quite so much. People speak different languages. You know, there are people that are highly educated there are people that, some are illiterate. You know, there are every kind of person in this world. And I mean, you, you try not seeing the fact that, man, that guy's six inches taller than me. Or, you know, we've all seen those progressive commercials about how not to become your parents, you know, the the guy with the purple hair or whatever, and you know, you know, we all see it, we all see it, you know. You try not seeing that. You know, you know, there's the bald headed guy that's covered his entire head in tattoos. I don't care who you are. If you're not blind, you see that. And it's different. And yet, in Christ, Despite everything that's different, I'm supposed to look at that person and say, I wouldn't get those tattoos on my head. You know, I don't like needles, you know, but um, there are other reasons too. But, you know, he's made in God's image. I see, if I see the way I ought to see, I realize every single person and one of the things I got to thinking about today is sometimes I want to stress that about, you know, people that maybe I want to see as an inferior. But it also applies to those that are the kind I'm, I want to be envious of. You know, as, as I told a friend one time, I said, you know, just because you're better than me doesn't mean you have to act like it, you know. I mean, you know, there are... You are a really great person if there's never been somebody that you didn't say. At least think, I'm jealous of his or her, you know, and something about them you're jealous of. What I have to put a, do as, as a Christian is remember, made in God's image. In Genesis 1, 26, 27, he made them male and female in his image. Sometimes people say, 
Well, you know, but, but when Adam and Eve sinned, it tarnished that image. Well, I grant you, people don't always act like they're made in the image of God. But after they came off the ark in Genesis 9 and verse 6, he said that if a man sheds another man's blood, he was to be put to death. Why? Because man was made in God's image. You know, everybody's made in God's image. You think about in 1 Timothy 6. I mentioned that list earlier. You've got all those things that at least most of us as Christians, we do think, of, man, those are bad things. And, and, and most of the people of the world would include stealing and in the bad. Maybe not the greed. But he has reviling. Why is it so bad to... Why would he list reviling in the things that keep us from the kingdom of God? Well, because when we are insulting people and belittling people, we are belittling those made in the image of God. Isn't that what he says in James 3, 9 and 10? That if we bless God and curse men who are made in the similitude of God, then there's a problem. You know, how do I see people? I try not to be looked down on anybody. I try not to be jealous of anybody because they're all made in God's image. And if, I, if I've got the proper perspective, I never ask the question that lawyer asked in Luke 10. You ever thought about him? He asked Jesus two questions. Even though the first question may have come from a bad motive, it was the best question anybody could ever ask. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That was a great question. Jesus said to him, well, how do you read the law? And he answered it very well. He gave him the first two commandments. This man told Jesus what Jesus would later say were the first two commandments. And Jesus said, okay, go do that. Then he had to have a follow-up question. Who is my neighbor? You know, exactly who am I supposed to love? And of course, Jesus tells the parable of the good Samaritan. You know, the priest walked by, the Levite walked by, that accursed Samaritan. Samaritan. He helped. In the flesh. And that's what Paul's saying there in 2 Corinthians 5. When we see things in the flesh, our neighbor is that guy we feel some kind of affinity toward. You know, there's something about him or her that attracts us to them. In Christ... The one who died for his enemies, then I never ask the question, Who is my neighbor? At the end of the parable, Jesus said, Who proved himself to be a neighbor to that man? If I'm in Christ, if I really have altered my perspective in the right way, and this is the kind of thing that's a battle that has to be fought. I see people the way Jesus saw Zacchaeus. People said, I mean, little child, I, you know, we remember, I thought Zacchaeus was about that tall, you know. I mean, I, mean, I sang about him being a wee little man, you know. Uh, Zacchaeus came down from the tree. Jesus went to his house. Oh, this man's gone to be with a sinner. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. How did Jesus see the world? He saw a world full of sin. But he didn't just sit and wring his hands and complain about it. And, you know, he came to save them. He died on the cross. I see people that way if I really have altered my perspective. I think about Matthew 18. How being in Christ... Changes the way I see people. Peter asked the question about forgiveness. Lord, 
how often, verse 21, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Forgiveness can be tough. People... And the, the, the people that I'm, I've been saying that we've got to love and we've got to be good neighbors to and they're made in the image of God and we're not going to revile them, they can hurt us deeply. They can inflict some pretty harsh wounds. How in the world can I forgive when I've been hurt so badly? I think about my forgiveness. That's the key to it. He tells this parable about a king that had a servant that owed him 10,000 talents. Let me suggest to you, when you read the parables of Jesus, there are many times he uses hyperbole to make a point. And I mean by that, he, you know, we talk about parables like they're real life stories. That's not always the case. What kind of servant would be able to run up a debt of 10,000 talents? That would be the equivalent of millions of dollars. You know. And then the king just wipes it away. But then, of course, this guy goes out and he is owed 100 denarii by a fellow servant. And he got him by the throat, you know, pay me what you will, you know, cast him into prison. And of course, the master finds out about it and revokes his forgiveness. And he says, verse 35, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Jesus used an absurd number to make a point that what we have been forgiven is an, um, an amount, if you will, that is just unimaginable. And what anybody has done to us pales in comparison. If you want a, a number to compare, what the first man was forgiven was 600,000 times as much as he was unwilling to forgive. I don't know. There's no way to put it exact in dollar terms. But he was forgiven 600,000 times as much money as he was unwilling to forgive. If I can remember that, that I've been forgiven a debt that's just astronomical, you know, that could never have been paid off, then it helps me with others. And one last thing about people. What I've been saying is about people. Trying to see people as souls that need to be saved. People made in the image of God. But I'll also see my fellow disciple differently. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith. Galatians 6.10 Ephesians, Acts, the first few chapters, chapter 4 especially, one heart and one soul. My fellow disciples, you know, they may, you know, outside of Christ, we might not have anything in common. You know, we may, you know, one's a sports fan, one's not a sports fan. One's college educated, the other is not. You know, none of those things matter. In Christ, if you're a fellow disciple, you're special. We see people differently in Christ. We see family different. There are a lot of families outside of Christ. But I want you just to try to imagine that this couple, they're dating, they get married, neither one of them Christians. Why does he marry her? Why does she marry him? 
Well, the answer is easy, right? They're, they're in love. Love's a wonderful thing, right? You know? But why, why is he in love with her? Because she appeals to him. She's pretty. You know, she does something for him. Why is he in love? Or why is she in love with him? He's handsome. Has a big bank account. Sometimes the bank account's big enough that he doesn't have to be that handsome, you know? I mean, but it's... There is a real sense in which what brought the two of them together is somewhat of a, a selfish mentality. But doesn't all that change in Christ? I mean, one of the very first things that changes if, one, if, if those two people became Christians, you know, they got married hoping it would work out. They become Christians that perspective changes. They see it differently now. They now read Matthew 19, 6, what God's joined together, let not man separate. They read Matthew 19, 9. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And no longer are they hoping it works out. They're committed to working it out if they're both seeing things as God sees them. But beyond that, look at Ephesians 5 for just a second. And again, this could be and has been entire lessons. But the very verse that precedes the beginning of the discussion of marriage says submitting to one another in the fear of God. Then he says, wives... Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 33, he concludes the marriage discussion. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. She sees things differently now. But look at him. Verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Verse 20, 28, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. How do they see that relationship in Christ? Well, that selfishness has to go out the window. Now, She's not asserting her place. She's taking her place. And he, what's he doing? He is loving her in a way that is sacrificial. He nourishes, he cherishes. He loves her as his own body. The selfishness is gone. Verse 4, you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. If this couple, they got married not being Christians, had children, what would their goals be for their children? Well, of course, they, they're going to want them to go to college one day. You know, depending on what the interests of the parents are, they may want them to excel in the arts or in music in sports, in academics, all these things. And there's nothing wrong with any of those I've named. But if they became Christians, they'd realize all those have to be secondary. What's most important is that my child grow up to know the Lord. That they be brought up in the discipline, the training and admonition of the Lord. The Christian, you know, you know, at, at first glance, the family of a Christian and a non-Christian may look alike. You know, I know there are a lot of times that's not the case, but, you know, a man and a woman, children, you know, they all, it looks the same. 
But if we're really Christians, we've got a whole completely different mindset about things than those of the world. We see things differently. This is a lesson that could go on and on. And somebody said, well, it already has. But no, uh, I've told you before, I, I scratch out my outlines first on a legal pad and then I later type them up. I had more points on the legal pad and I decided to be kind to y'all and you know, didn't include all of them. Every one of the examples I've used I think is important. And I, and I hope you remember things we said about them. But more than anything else, I wanted to multiply examples for the point of getting us to see the new perspective in Christ. The all things have become new is really all things. Every aspect of our lives and our relationships is in some way altered when we become Christians. That doesn't mean we necessarily have a different job. You know, we're still married to the same person. We still live in the same community, but we see everything differently. Go back to 2 Corinthians 5 as we close this. Let me re read those verses again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We need to see things with fresh eyes, new eyes. I've had people that have had LASIK surgery or cataract surgery, and they'd say, I just couldn't believe the difference. The whole world looked different after this surgery. I saw things differently. We need to make sure we see things differently. Before we sing the song for your encouragement, look at verses 20 and 21. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This lesson tonight has been about those who are in Christ. But what if you're not in Christ? You've never come by faith confessing your sins or confessing your faith in Christ and turning from your sins to be baptized into Christ. Paul's plea, my plea, be reconciled to God. If we can help you, you come as we stand and sing together. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel and in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up, and we believe you'll find these to be true to God's Word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.